good morning or good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world. Talent Finders would like to welcome Grammy-winning producer, composer, arranger, and consultant lecturer Brent Fisher. So welcome, Brent. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? Fine, thanks. Good. Glad to be with you. Thank you. So firstly, I would like to congratulate you on all your achievements. Can you share with us how your career started? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't even think I can remember back that far. <laughs> uh, the, the earliest memories I have are of uh, lying underneath my father's grand piano um, when I was about two years old, listening to him write, compose, arrange, um, all the stuff that I do today. Now, uh, my, he saw my musical abilities develop. Uh, I became a professional musician at age 15. And I've been doing it ever since, uh, performing, writing music, touring, uh, producing. And, um, you know, within the last 10 years or so, I realized I had become the de facto CEO of my own record label. At, at first, we were just self-releasing music for different people. But then I realized, oh, okay, I, I find myself making all sorts of decisions about marketing and uh, where we're going to get CDs manufactured or who's going to stream the music or, you know, all this stuff, merchandise sales. Um, so here I am all these years later, and it just uh, kind of never stopped. I think uh, by the time I grew up and realized that there were other careers besides music, uh, it was kind of too late, so I just kept going. That's amazing. So you credit uh, your late father, is it Dr. Clay Fisher, can you please share with us more about that and how he influenced or impacted your career? Sure. Uh, so, you know, being in a, in a musical family like this, I was surrounded by what he was doing all the time. Uh, when he understood that I knew when I was about five or six years old, that when he took me into a recording studio to, to make an album or record a movie or a TV show or something like that, when, I, when, I, uh, when he knew he could trust me, that when I saw the red light go on in the recording studio, that, that I would be completely silent. Um, then he started taking me with me, taking me with him yeah. to all the different uh, things that he was doing. And I would go on tour with him sometimes as a child. Uh, I picked up all these instruments as I was going along. And um, at some point we started working together. I, th I think I was 15 years old and uh, that lasted for 32 years until the end of his life. And it was, um, you know, a great experience for me, not only because we worked well together, but because I liked what he was doing so much that uh, I decided to continue what he had started, the, uh, all the music concepts, which he had sort of been blazing trails and I just sort of kept going with them and have been uh, blazing a few trails of my own. That's amazing. So did you always know that you wanted to pursue a career in the creative and music industry when you were growing up and who and what in terms of genres and other talents influenced you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I do have other interests. These, these came along sort of later, uh, you know, uh, stocks, real estate, uh, space exploration. If I, if I hadn't become a, uh, a, a musician, I yeah. might be working with Elon Musk at SpaceX right now. We don't know. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> I anyway. love Elon. I'm a huge, but he's ex South yeah. African, so I, I feel like I have some kind of connection. <laughs> sure, and he's just got a he's got a great concept going for um, uh, how we can benefit all people here on planet Earth. Mm. I mean, it's the same concept as NASA, really. Um, I, I wish they would put forth this this you know subject more often. It's, Everything that NASA and SpaceX is doing is to benefit people right here on planet Earth. But it's all, yeah, part of it is overcoming all these problems. How, how, do, we get, how do we get human beings into space and become uh, the, on the next level of exploration? We've explored almost the whole planet. Still have a lot to go in the deep oceans, but um, that's going well. Yeah. The next thing we have to do is uh, the space exploration. But anyway, getting back to music... Um, I, I just took to it very easily. It was very natural for me because I was around it all the time through my father. Yes. Um, it just, uh, you know, 
I learned as I went. Now I have a degree in music, um, and uh, and that helped me a great deal too. I, I never thought that uh, I would be standing in front of an orchestra and conducting, um, conducting an orchestra when I would you know when I was back 15 years old doing my first professional gig on bass. Um, wow or recording albums or things like that. I just thought I would be a musician, travel around the world. And, you know, I've been to lots of uh, great countries, you know, all over the planet and uh, even to Antarctica. It gives you a, a great- That's amazing. A great, uh, you know, world view and, and sort of informs my, my role as a, as a citizen of the planet. Yes. And also it broadens your perspective on a lot of things too. So I think that's a great thing. Yeah. So the music industry is a highly competitive and very cutthroat industry. So what do you believe makes you different in terms of the music you produce? And how have you managed to sustain and maintain such a long career? Well, I think two key terms that uh, I can draw upon are differentiation yes. and uh, timelessness. So those are two things that I go for and I think help me stand out. One is... is uh, to differentiate the sound of what I'm doing. And I work across all, almost every genre you can imagine, and, and some maybe that you haven't imagined yet. Um, but uh, that, that was my, my goal was never about sticking in one genre or doing one thing. Um, I'm more interested in creativity than what genre is, because I think creativity can exist across all music genres. And as far as having a timeless quality to the music, um, that's also part of the thinking. That yeah. is uh, that I, I want what I'm working on right now to be relevant for today, but to have elements in it that will be something that, especially when I'm, you know, when I'm working for somebody else and I'm trying to give them something that can be a hit today and to, uh, to help them with their following but also help them with their longevity so that if, uh, you know, I, if, if I have done my job right, hopefully 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people are still listening to this music. And I'm glad actually that uh, in, in the case of many artists that I've worked with, people are still listening to these artists that I worked with in the uh, 80s, 90s and early 2000s. Yes, that's amazing. So... What would you say some of your biggest lessons and learnings have been within your career? And I'm uh, sure there's been many, but maybe like what stands out for you the most? Always have multiple contingency plans. Yes. <laughs> there can be... Especially in the in music industry. There can be so many different things that you can't foresee, but as you gain experience, um, you can start foreseeing what can go right, what can go wrong, what can be unexpected developments, so that uh, no matter what happens, you can still go with it and persevere. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing. If we had four or five hours, I could name specifics. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, I, and I mean, it's the same thing when you talk about differentiation and timelessness in music. I could talk to you about the uh, the, you know, sort of, unique uh, music concepts that I have uh, been pioneering with my father for many years. Mm. Um, I, what, I, what I like to uh, make as an analogy is, is, is think about um, you're reading a book by one of your favorite authors and you are looking at how he weaves a story with just the words on the paper. And that uh, every once in a while, you may need to look up a word that you haven't seen since your, you know, college vocabulary tests or something like that. But once you look up that word that this uh, gifted author has used, you realize, wow, that is just the right word to convey this type of sentiment or this type of, you know, whatever the communication is that the author is trying to get across. And he's not doing it in a, in, a, in a sense to be abstruse or vituperous. You know, he's just using the right combinations of words in the right way to get across very deep and subtle nuances of thoughts. Yes. And it's, so it's the same in music. And that's what I'm going after. Amazing. 
So Thanks. when did your big break happen or was it a multitude of smaller accomplishments within your career? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I never set out to become a celebrity yes. or to become a, uh, a type of person that is um, on the cusp of, you know, all the current trends. Instead, it was, yeah, it was more the, uh, the, the accomplishments that went along with my career. I'm mostly a behind the scenes person. Yes, I do go on stage quite often and, and have been for, for most of my life. Oh. Um, but uh, what I'm looking for is, is you know, the rec recognition from my peers in the music industry and also from music scholars. And that's a big, important thing to me that, that uh, I'm, I'm not sure that a lot of people are thinking about in the music industry is the, is the scholarly value that, that researchers will look at your music and find things about it that you did that uh, they don't see other people doing. And that helps to, uh, you know, they say that music can't evolve or yeah. that the arts can't evolve. You can just create different things, but I disagree with that. Yeah. I feel that there are definite changes going on that are based on history. And that's part of my timeless approach to music is I'm basing it on the entire history of music. I'm not just studying, you know, this great guitarist that uh, was popular in the 60s and 70s. I'm studying writers that uh, lived in the 1700s or the 1900s and and um you know all these all these different aspects that i can look at so so that's part of it the other part is of course this is a business as well so um you want to find as many revenue streams as you can and grow those multiple revenue streams yes and it's so very important this, this is how i manage my career amazing so you have some incredible international artists that you have arranging credits and pop royalties from Michael Jackson, Usher, Elvis Costello, just to name a few, which is incredible. So can you share with us um, how this came about and what was the experience, what was that experience like um, and how did those opportunities come about? Well, everything that I had at the beginning came to me uh, through working with my father. Now, as I, you know, went around in the music industry and, uh, you know, built my reputation, then other people started hiring me. But I was always around, um, you know, heavyweights in the industry, other heavyweights besides my father. And so a lot of them knew me. And then when they saw me working with them, they saw that, uh, you know, it wasn't like one of those family situations where the parent needs to look after the child, even as, you know, that child becomes an adult. This was a situation where I was, be given, I was being given difficult tasks and I had to rise to the occasion each time and, um, you know, put in the long hours or whatever I needed to do. And so when other people saw that, that just uh, led to the, you know, the work taking on many, many different types of forms. And each time something came along new mm. that I had to learn how to do, like, you know, if I needed to hire an orchestra for somebody, I figured out how to do that. And I figured out how to get the contracts done right. And, uh, you know, when it turned out that, that, uh, I needed to negotiate a, a, a book deal or a record deal for my dad. Then I researched how to do that. And I talked to people and I gained information. Um, I had a great uh, instructor in college that said, once you get your degree, that's when the real learning begins. Yay. And um, that's because at that point, you have the tools to teach yourself what you need to know to get this next element of business in place. And so that's really how everything developed and uh, and continues today wow it's amazing story i love it <laughs> so you're a grammy award-winning composer and producer which is phenomenal can you share with us more about that and what that moment was like for you and having won a grammy which is obviously one of the highest accomplishments in music what was that like um, and did it open other doors within your career yeah, so um, I've been a part of many different Grammy-winning or Grammy-nominated albums over the years. Uh, yeah. I, 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 don't, I can't even 
keep count at this point, but the ones that I was directly involved in on a large scale and actually the, the ones that I produced for people that, that uh, got them Grammys and eventually got me a Grammy, uh, those are the ones that, you know, it's, it's great to have that recognition from your peers. Yes, and yes, it does, it does help in your um in your sort of day-to-day -day activities in the music industry it's something that uh, it, it's kind of like uh getting a um you know like uh, a, a medical professional becoming a doctor mm. or getting certification as a as a nurse or something or a certification as a specialist it's a way of your peers letting you know that uh they believe that in this particular case you've done something extra special to merit having this rec recognition. Yeah, and yeah. so in that case, it's, it's, uh, it's been wonderful. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, but it's part of the ongoing process. I also have plenty of gold records and CDs from, um, you know, my past works with uh, other artists. And so that's another type of recognition. Uh, the, 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 the best type of recognition that I'm looking for also is, 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 uh, besides the fans and the people that want to learn about what I do and want to support what I do through enjoying my art um, is, is again those uh, people who research music and have a scholarly interest and want to write uh, another doctoral dissertation about some element of Fisher music over the years. That's, that's also something that to me is a, is a great type of recognition. but. Uh, but yeah, the, the Grammys are kind of like the highlight of the career, right? I would say. Yes, amazing. So COVID-19 has turned our world upside down and inside out. So can you please share with us how this has impacted you and what have you done to adapt, you know, within this climate? Can you give us any examples? Yeah, well, I guess I've been fortunate in the past that um, you know, the music industry, especially when I was starting out, was had a lot of ups and downs for me. You know, there could be times when I'd be so busy that I wasn't even getting a chance to sleep more than two or three hours at night. And then uh, all of a sudden, all the projects were done and I'd get time. And, and so I, I knew that I had free time at that point and I would make use of that time. Uh, again, if, if you have multiple revenue streams, um, then you can you can be able to get something done regardless of what happens like for instance the people that i knew uh the people that i know that are strictly touring musicians and performing musicians have have been very hard hit during this pandemic um the people that i know that have been teaching online for years um they are pretty much business as usual and maybe even more business so uh it was a question of uh, adapting to the circumstances and concentrating on those revenue streams, uh, those activities that I can engage in right now during the pandemic. Uh, that's not to say that I've been completely inactive on some of these other fronts too. I have done uh, live concerts outdoors with all safety protocols in place. Everybody stayed healthy. I checked in with, you know, all the performers. We had, you know, giant spread out area for the musicians uh, that were performing. So none of them were more than, uh, you know, six feet or two meters uh, closer to each other. And then we had the audience spread out, took temperatures, wear masks, all those things. Uh, I've done recording sessions where we had to, uh, you know, have everybody come in and just sit in their place wearing their mask. And, uh, you know, we, like I did in a, a string recording session, well, string players, um, you know, just play their, their string instrument. They don't need to blow through a horn or anything like that. So they can keep their masks on. Uh, they need to see the emotion on my face as I'm conducting. So I took my mask off and I stepped behind this uh, this giant plexiglass shield uh, that they had conducted for me in the studio. And so in, in that way, we got to keep our business activities and also being, you know, being able to make music. We, we got to keep those activities going. And uh, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's just been a question of adapting 
and adjusting and also keeping busy when there yes, were times it's that it's very important. You know, I, I did a lot of studying this last year. I got out old music books and uh, read through, you know, all this these uh, this music I have from uh, Johann Sebastian Bach or wow. uh, all the other great uh, classical composers and just you know again learn new things, keep busy practicing. So I've gotten to practice more this year. Yeah. Um, so just yeah, I you know my advice for anybody, no matter what situation you're in, is is make sure you keep busy. Yes. Don't uh, don't especially, sit around. Especially for one's mental sanity as well. Yeah. Now, I'm not an extrovert. I don't like to be in the middle of a crowd. Uh, I'm not an introvert either. But, uh, you know, not being an extrovert, I think, has made it a little easier for me. And I know that um, there are people who are extroverts that they really miss the social interaction. And I think um, doing things like this is helpful, yes. you know, where you, can, where you can have interactions with people, even if you're distant. Uh, that's, you know, that's a great, that's a great thing to be able to do. So, yeah, so I hope everybody will take this to heart and um, whatever you do, have a positive outlook and keep busy. Absolutely. <laughs> so technology and social media has impacted and changed the world in so many ways and made it more challenging uh, for musicians yeah. to make money and also shifted the way the industry does business. I'm sure you've seen many changes over the years. How do you think it's going to change moving forward, especially in the current environment that we're in? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people who likes to make uh, grand forecasts. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you know, people who have far more expertise than me. But, uh, but I will say that, um, for instance, well, the, yeah, the way that music is being consumed nowadays by listeners is uh, not really a sustainable model for the music industry. And there, there are a couple of reasons behind that. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if you're going to, if you're, if you're, if you're going to steal a movie from, from a, a film company, yeah. You're going to have to go through a lot of trouble because a, a movie is, you know, about four gigabytes of information. That, that's, that's a lot. You can't necessarily um, make copies and share it as easily as you can uh, something, you know, an MP3 file that's only uh, four megabytes and can be sent very easily in an email. Uh, so, and, and, and I always make the analogy that uh, when you stream music, when you listen to a music through a streaming service, um, it's, it's like the audio equivalent of uh, looking at a grainy newspaper picture in black and white. Yes. And, uh, and, and what you're doing is you're supporting a multinational corporation. Um, whereas when you decide to own a physical product by an artist, now, we, nobody could anticipate, you know, 10 or 15 years ago that LPs would make such a comeback, but they are. CDs are kind of, you know, people are saying, oh, CDs are on their way out. I think they'll make a comeback, too, at some point, because mm. people are realizing that, uh, you know, as, as great as streaming is, it's, it's definitely a tool that we need in the music industry. Very helpful. All these different streaming surface, services, uh, especially YouTube, is, is great for uh, learning about different music out there. So, so it's definitely got a reason for existing. But uh, when, you, when you own a physical product, and it doesn't have to be an LP or a CD, it could be a, you know, a t-shirt or a poster from your favorite artist, um, then you're really supporting the artist at that point. And the music you're going to listen to, if you do get a CD or an LP, is going to be like when you're looking at high resolution photos or videos, it's, it's gonna be that much better quality than these low resolution files that you get from streaming. And I know that there are audio file sites where you can stream in high definition. 
you know, if you want to pay that monthly fee for the rest of your life to be able to listen to that music and, and but, you know, you take the risk that they're going to take it away at some point. They're going to remove some things from rotation, make this stuff premium, make that stuff, you know, part of the normal package. If you own that music, if you own a physical product like an LP or a CD yeah. um, or a DVD in a case of film, yeah. you can watch it for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And never, you never have to pay for anything again. And yet the amount of money that the artist gets from that one time purchase is greater than an artist can get from years and years of streaming revenue. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what would you say some of your biggest career highlights have been? Well, like I said before, it was uh, the, uh, the Grammy related stuff. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, there was, uh, you know, I, I got to go to the Grammys to watch my father win a Grammy when I was a young man of, I don't know, 22 or 23 years old. Um, I performed on stage in an orchestra that I and my father wrote the arrangement for Prince and Beyonce. So I got to, I got to perform on stage with Prince and Beyonce at the opening of the 2004 Grammy Awards telecast in front of about 40 million people. Wow. That was, uh, you know, that was tremendous putting together that project, especially since uh, it came up right before I was supposed to go to New Zealand on vacation. And, you know, I had to cut my trip short and end up uh, writing music, you know, while I was down there a little bit. And, and uh, so it, it happened very quickly at the last minute. But, uh, you know, I'd had many projects by then that yeah. were like that. So it wasn't like, oh, gosh, this is overwhelming. I can't handle it. It was just another one of those, okay, we've got to, you know, really batten down the hatches now and get to work and, uh, and get things going in a timely and efficient way. I mean, that's, that's one of my mottos for all these years is quality music on time and within the budget. Yes. I don't find myself having problems like uh, writer's block or not being inspired or something, you know, if I need to do a quick turnaround, you know, I, I wrote the, uh, the arrangement for Michael Jackson in 72 hours because they made a last minute decision that they wanted wow. to add a large orchestra to this song that they found, you know, laying around in his private collection after he had passed away. So, um, you know, when I had met him before and we had talked about doing various projects, nothing that came together during his lifetime, but these were, you know, these were all great things that happened. Uh, and then, um, you know, more recently, when I got my own Grammy in 2013 uh, for a, uh, a Latin jazz big band album that I did for my father right after he had passed away, um, including a lot of his playing that we had recorded during his lifetime. And um, more recently, 2016, um, another artist that I worked for, D'Angelo, mm won two Grammy Awards uh, that year for best R&B song for uh, Really Love. That's the song that I uh, wrote, arranged, and produced the orchestra for him on that song. Yeah. And then he won best R&B album that year. So, wow, that was, uh, that's you know, that amazing. Was great. Yeah, so, so there are, you know, a couple of the many different genres, for example, that I've been involved in. But uh, the, I guess, you know, all the career hi highlights would be too numerous to list right now. And they're yeah. just because of all the great people that I've had the opportunity to work with and, and to make music with those people. Yeah, no, that's incredible. So what would you say some of the three key pieces of advice you would like to give others who would like to pursue a career in this industry? And what legacy would you like to leave or how would you like to be remembered? That's an excellent question. Um, first of all, Okay, so if, if I would have to narrow down uh, advice to, you know, to three tips that I could give, basic tips. Uh, number one, if you're going to be in the music industry, and this is going to sound surprising, um, learn music, learn about music. I, and, and I know a lot of people say, you know, I've, I've had a lot of success in the music industry, and I, know, I don't know how to play the piano or the guitar. I just know what good music is, and, you know, I've been doing great. But... I mean, you know, think, do, do, uh, do people work like that in any other industry? You know, do people like that are working in the, in this massive sports industry saying, yeah, I, I don't know anything about baseball. I don't know the rules. I, I, you know, I don't know how to shoot a basket, but I know what I like in sports. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so I'm working in the sports. It, it is possible. But if you learn about music and you learn the basics and all the terminology, then you'll be able, be able to communicate with a lot of different people in such, you know, on such a deeper level. So that's number one. Mm. Number two, in the music industry, you should be able to do anything. Don't think that just because you're really good at playing, um, I don't know, reggae guitar, that people are always going to hire you to play just reggae music. And that, that could be your love and you could become very famous at doing that. And it, I don't know. But in the meantime, you need to be able to do anything yeah. that comes along and, uh, and that you need to dig your, uh, you know, dig your teeth into so you can get that experience. And then the next time you do it, it's, it's going to be easy. Um, so that's, that's number two. You need, you need to be able to learn about uh, how royalties work and how publishing works and how contracts work, uh, which leads me to tip number three. And that is um, know your own worth and be able to negotiate how much you will be paid. Mm. Don't think that if you give away your music that it will lead to people actually spending money on you in mm. the future. It'll just lead to more people asking you to give them free music. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that once you decide you're going to charge for making music, that you'll actually be able to convince people to pay you for your music. That's a whole other ballgame. So you need to know how to, you need to know how to um, specifically state what you're going to be able to give them, why it's worth money for them, and how it will improve their life or improve their career because yeah. of what you are adding, this value that you are adding to them. So you yeah. need to know how to negotiate because there is no standard. There's no, there's no minimum wage. There's no maximum wage. There's, there's no, uh, you know, there's no table anywhere where somebody has written down, well, you should get paid this much for doing that. I mean, there are, there are ranges of salaries that you can get for doing this or that type of music related job. But ultimately it's up to you as, as a negotiator. And, uh, and then looking back at, uh, or, or sort of looking into what I think um, I would like my legacy to be is yeah. to get people to uh, look deeper into the arts, uh, you know, beyond just being entertainment. It has so much more value yeah. than uh, what you're going to get just from that, that sort of that transient experience of having art in front of you at that point. Yeah. It can be attached to all sorts of memories in your life. Um, so I would say, especially when it comes to music, that our sense of hearing is, is one of the least developed human senses. Think about it. When you go into, uh, you know, during normal times, you go into a nice restaurant, or let's say right now an outdoor restaurant where that's applicable. Um, and, uh, you know, you walk into the place, right away you smell the food, and you can recognize, I smell whatever, I, I, you know, I smell a chocolate sauce, or I smell a steak, or I smell, you know, barbecue chicken. Whatever it is, you have a name for that smell. Yeah. You taste the food. You say, I taste strawberries, or I, I taste, uh, you know, I taste carrot. Yes. You have a name for that. Uh, when you touch an apple, you understand the tactile sensations and you can describe them. You're using yes. terminology for what you feel when you are grabbing an apple. Oh, yeah, this apple's nice and hard and crispy. It's ready to eat, right? Um, but when you're, when you're listening to the music in this restaurant, that's playing in the background. Can you, for instance, realize that um, there are three background singers behind the main singer. The chord you're hearing right now is a B flat major seven. Uh, there's a trumpet and a sax playing a D and an F. Mm. And uh, the drums are in a four, four time signature, for example, and uh, playing, you know, this specific type of beat. Can you recognize all that? I mean, you can, you can look at all the colors around the restaurants. Maybe there are paintings on the wall. There's cool design architecture somewhere. You say, hey, that's blue. That's green. That's, you know, that's magenta. That's chartreuse. Mm. We can have all this different terminology that we can use to describe 
what we are sensing, but not necessarily what we hear. Yes. And so maybe that's some small legacy that I can leave behind is, yes. uh, is to in, encourage people to even get a basic music education because you know what it will help your it will help your calculations at business music there's there's a there's a deep relationship between music math and the universe the way the universe works um and, and you know i'm not talking about like uh, social interaction or anything at this yeah, time yeah, i'm talking sure. about actually you know planetary um production and uh whatever space travel and all these things infinitely related to mathematics and that's related to music. So having an understanding of music uh, and knowing a little bit about the terminology will, um, will have untold benefits, including helping you just when you need to, you know, calculate your expenses and uh, yeah. anything else that's going on in your life that has to do with uh, finance, mathematics, all those things. So I would hope that that could be a small part of my legacy besides uh, the music that I've left behind. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Brent, for joining us. And uh, if anybody wants to connect with you, what are the best platforms to do so? Well, uh, you can go to my website, brentfisher.com. That's B-R-E-N-T-F-I-S-C-H-E-R. Yeah. Um, check out my father's website too, please, clairefisher.com. And um, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, yeah. Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, Twitter, um, you know, when I uh, when I'm saying goodbye to an audience at concerts, I always uh, you know say basically the same thing. I say uh, you know if you if you like our music, please uh, follow me on Instagram. If you don't like my music, please still follow me on Instagram <laughs> for, for sure. obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, so you can instigate with us on Instagram. You can tweet with us on Twitter. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, and uh, please like us everywhere. And uh, so yeah, so. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm around on social media, and, uh, and then there is a contact form on my website. And if there's anybody who has uh, been, uh, you know, seriously interested by what I've talked about right now, I'd be very happy to talk to you about it in greater detail at a future time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brent, and hopefully we can have you back in the future. Great. I would love that. Thanks so much. Thank you.